Well, this evening we're going to jump into John chapter 19, and I'd like to read the um, first 16 verses, and that will be our text for this evening. John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. Would you please listen carefully to this as I read it? This is the word of the Lord. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, say, Hail King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. And by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority Over me, unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out. And sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. So they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. May the Lord again bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now this morning we noted that Jesus suffered many more things at the hands of his people in order to bring us to heaven. Uh, first we saw they broke two, tri- or two laws in his trials. They tried him at night for a capital crime, which was something that was only to be done in the day, and they passed sentence the same day, which again was contrary to Jewish law. Secondly, they tried to convince Pilate to execute Jesus on the basis of their trial, not bringing any specific charges against him, but simply accusing him of being an evil doer. And then third, when that failed, They twisted his claim to be the king of the Jews into a political plot to overthrow the Roman government. Now, after Pilate had the opportunity to cross-examine Jesus, he realized that he was innocent of anything he was concerned about, which, of course, would have been treason. And so he tried to have Jesus released. He first tried to do so by invoking the annual tradition of releasing a prisoner at the Passover. If he couldn't convince the leaders, perhaps he could convince the people who had gathered together, but that too failed because the leaders stirred up the people to ask for Barabbas rather than Jesus. And remember, we saw that that too was hypocritical on their part because these Jewish leaders hated Barabbas for the same reason that they hated Jesus. Barabbas was not merely a robber, as we saw, but he was one who had taken part in a, an insurrection, in a rebellion against Rome that could have potentially caused them to lose their position and their power with Rome. Now, they hated Rome, but they didn't want to lose the authority that Rome had allowed them as the leaders of Israel. Now, the result was that Jesus was now slated 
to take the place of Barabbas on the cross that was meant for him. Remember, the other two men that are sacrificed or actually crucified with Jesus were also robbers, but that's the same word that was used of Barabbas. They were also insurrectionists who had joined Barabbas in the insurrection. So basically, Jesus is taking the place of Barabbas on the cross that was meant for him between two of his fellow insurrectionists. Now, here is where we pick up in the narrative. This evening, we want to see four things. First of all, Pilate's further attempts to free Jesus, although not without some measure of punishment. The Jews' continuing unwillingness to allow Pilate to release him. Pilate's increasing fear of Jesus. And then God's sovereignty in Jesus' crucifixion how he basically arranged all of these things that Jesus might go to the cross. So first of all, we see Pilate's further attempts to free Jesus. Pilate was still hoping to, re to free the Lord Jesus and seeing that his, uh, his attempt to do so by offering Jesus uh, in place of Barabbas uh, failed. And so in order to spare Jesus from crucifixion, we see that Pilate now hands him over to be scourged. We read in verse 1, Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. Now that, of course, was no picnic, but it was still better than crucifixion. Scourging by the Romans was done, as you probably know well by now, with a whip that was called a cat of nine tails. Those nine tails were basically nine leather uh, thongs that had bits of metal and bone that were tied into them. The victim was usually whipped 40 times, though in the Jewish tradition, and we're not sure exactly that that would have been carried out in this case, perhaps it was, they would spare one of those lashes, so you only get 39. The lashing, however, with this whip, with this metal and bone, would leave the back raw and bloody. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing for this, there's a, a video on YouTube that uh, shows like a... Uh, uh, computer graphic sort of back of a man, and it shows you how the Romans would apply the whip to the back, <coughs> whipping one way, then another way, and then moving around on the back until virtually the entire back in those 40 lashes has been uh, flayed. Now, in the area where they would perform this act, they also dug out these holes and they would put salt in the holes, and after they were finished, uh, scourging their, their victim, basically, they would take that salt and throw it on the wound to increase the pain. You can imagine. It wasn't uncommon for one who was scourged in this way to die merely from the shock of this process alone. But of course, Jesus didn't die. Though Pilate meant this to placate the Jews and a means to spare Jesus, he was actually fulfilling what God had determined many years earlier that he was going to put his son through. Again, we're going to come to this point at the very end. This was all a part of God's plan, even the scourging and, and the abuse. But here's a couple of passages. First one from a very familiar one, Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging, we are healed. And in Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. We're going to see the humiliation and spitting here in just a moment. But again, Jesus did not withdraw his back. He didn't, he gave his back. He gave himself. And he went through the scourging. As a matter of fact, by his scourging, we are healed. We do need to see that everything that Jesus went through in his sufferings as he's heading up to the cross also had uh, some atoning value. Now, we noted that when Jesus was in the garden and he was preparing to go through all this suffering, especially the wrath of God on the cross, as he looked forward and he began to pray, he was sweating blood. The atonement had already begun. And here again, we see our Lord 
shedding blood. He died a very bloody death, and with each blood letting, he was inching closer and closer to death, the death by which he would atone for our sins. Again, we read in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And Jesus was suffering in these things. He was suffering for our sins. So Pilate had Jesus scourged. Now, hoping further to satisfy the Jews, he went a little bit further, and next he handed Jesus over to his soldiers to humiliate him, to ridicule him. We read in verses 2 and 3, And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. They began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Instead of a crown of gold, they planted on his head a crown of thorns, which, as you know from the depictions of our Lord Jesus Christ, would cause even more blood to flow and to trickle from his head. They put a purple robe on him, which is the color of royalty. Uh, in the other accounts, we see he also, they also put a reed in his hand for a scepter. They greeted him with this saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And as they slapped him in the face, they took the reed from his hand and began to beat him uh, on the head. Now thinking he had done enough to satisfy them, though what Pilate had done here was unjust, yet it seems as though Pilate was trying to satisfy them and trying to allow Jesus to go free with just this punishment, but even this punishment was unjust. Pilate came out again to affirm that Jesus was an innocent man. He didn't deserve any of this. We read in verses 4 and 5, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. So Pilate left Jesus in his humiliated condition, perhaps hoping that it would move the Jews to pity him. And he declared, Behold the man. You know, here's a man who has laid claim to being the king of Israel, but he is, after all, merely a man. You don't have to be concerned about him. But again, as we understand, this wasn't nearly enough to satisfy their hatred. So secondly, we see the Jews continuing unwillingness to have him released. We read in verse 6. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. In Mark 15, verse 14, we read that Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But we get a little more insight into Matthew 27, verse 18, that Pilate knew exactly why Jesus was there. And he knew it wasn't because he had committed a crime. He knew it was because they envied him. And that's exactly what it was. But he wanted them to admit it. Why do you want me to crucify him? What evil has he done? Now, having some sense of his duty to uphold justice and not wanting to execute an innocent man, he again reaffirms his unwillingness to do what they wanted, telling them that if this is what they want, they'll have to do it themselves. Now, we know that Pilate wasn't telling them that they should actually do this because they brought Jesus to Pilate originally because they knew they couldn't do it. We don't have a law by which we can put a man to death. We're not permitted to execute anyone. Pilate is simply telling them that he is not going to do it. But still, they refused to give up. We read in verse 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Now again, this is the main reason why the Jews hated him, although we understand that he was popularity with the people. It was also that motivation. Pilate understood that, but he, wasn't, he didn't know that this is what Jesus had claimed. But this is, in fact, what he claimed, and the Jews saw it as blasphemy. We read in John chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, 
But he answered them, the Jews, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. On another occasion, in John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The Jews understood what Jesus was saying about himself. There was no ambiguity in their minds. They knew that Jesus was claiming equality with God. And that is why the Jews in Jerusalem wanted to kill him, as we saw on numerous occasions as we're going through the Gospel of John. The Jews understood it. He said it plainly. Oddly, the cults of today can't seem to understand what Jesus was saying, but you need to understand that. I need to understand that. And when you have the chance to point it out to a Jew, show them, or, or to a cult, somebody in the cult, show them that the Jews understood that. But that is the claim he made, and for that claim, as far as they were concerned, he must die. But they can't execute him. Pilate needs to execute him, implying that it was his duty to uphold their law, which Pilate had been telling them it is not. So then we come thirdly to see Pilate's increasing fear of Jesus, and as his fear increases, also his desire to see him set free. Now, Pilate just heard something that he hadn't heard before, and that is that Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God. This caused his fear to escalate even further, and we see in verse 8, therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. It appears to have had the effect of confirming something that his wife had warned him of earlier in Matthew 27, verse 19, where we read this. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Pilate obviously was superstitious. He was already thinking about what his wife said, and now he hears that Jesus is the Son of God. So Pilate again retreats to consider what to do. We read in verse 9, And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. He appears to have to, wanted to know if Jesus really could have been the Son of God, but Jesus did not answer. Now, we've seen this on, actually, we didn't see it in this gospel, but in the other gospels, Jesus gave Herod exactly the same treatment. There were occasions when Jesus simply sat silent before his accusers, again fulfilling what the Scripture said regarding Jesus and what he would do in Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. So we see in verse 10 that Pilate tries to compel him to speak. Uh, Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? He thought perhaps the promise of release and the threat of crucifixion would loosen his tongue. But we understand release was not what was important to Jesus because Jesus knew why he was there. Jesus knew what had to take place and he knew that he could not be released. He had willingly given himself into their hands that he might crucify or be crucified. And so we come then to our last point. God's sovereignty in Jesus' crucifixion. We read in verse 11, Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Jesus is essentially saying here, the authority to release me or to crucify me, you only have this because of my Father's will. 
He's the one who established authority. He's the one who has given you this authority. He is the one who has put me in your hands. And everyone who has this authority given them by God are accountable to Him as far as how they exercise it. And so the implication here is, Pilate, you'd better use it righteously. Jesus goes on to say, this is also why the one who delivered me to you has committed the greater sin. Now, who is it that Jesus is referring to here? I think we often think that it's Judas, but I don't think it was Judas. I think it was Caiaphas, though both of them are guilty. By the way, I want to just say by, by way of aside, Jesus is telling us here that there are degrees of sin. You know, somebody has sinned worse than, than Pilate in this case, if Pilate miscarries justice. And because there are degrees of sin, there are also degrees of punishment, and that was meant to make Pilate think about what he was about to do. Jesus knew what he was going to do, but still, he warns him because Jesus is gracious. Now, Caiaphas sinned against Jesus, and how did he do that? By misusing the authority that God had given him in this gross miscarriage of justice, and that in the face of the clear light of God's law. Remember, where there is greater light, there is greater responsibility. Caiaphas knew what his responsibility was, but he misused it in order to deliver Jesus over to death. He has the greater sin because he has the greater knowledge. And of course, Judas was not without blame. He's the one who betrayed Jesus, and that was after he had walked with him for three and a half years and had sat under his teaching and had seen all of his miracles, even performing some miracles himself. Both men, Caiaphas and Judas, were inexcusable. And because both of them had greater light, both of them were more culpable. Both of them had greater sin. But again, I think Jesus here was referring more specifically to Caiaphas, the high priest the leader of Israel, the teacher of Israel, the one who should have known better. Now, the, real, the, the realization that he might do exactly the same thing that Caiaphas had just done made Pilate even more fearful. And so he made an even greater effort to try to release Jesus. Actually, he could have done that at any, at any time. But the problem was he had to get the Jews to agree to it, otherwise there might be a riot. But the Jews were not about to release Jesus. They finally had Jesus where they wanted Him, and so they began to threaten Pilate. We read in verse 12, as a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release Him. But the Jews cried out, saying, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. If you release Jesus, a potential insurrectionist, you are betraying Caesar. And if you betray Caesar, we will hold you accountable for this. Basically, we will see you impeached. Now, impeachment was something that existed even during the time of the Romans, and it was something that any Roman official would be deathly afraid of because he would lose his position. And this was something that was all it took to persuade Pilate to give them what they wanted. When Pilate heard this, he finally relented and he gave in to the Jews. We read in verse 13, therefore when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha, called the pavement because it was an, uh, an area like a plaza that was built from blocks of stone that formed some type of a pattern, a mosaic. It was also called Gabbatha in Hebrew because it was a raised area. The, the stones were rather large. John writes in verse 14, Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Now the day of preparation was Friday. Uh, basically the day before the Jewish Sabbath, which was on Saturday. Note again, it was about the sixth hour, and they believe this, I believe, to be Jewish time. So this place is very early in the morning. Remember that originally we saw this morning 
they brought Jesus to Pilate when it was the fourth watch of the night, between three and six. And now it's six o'clock in the morning, and uh, things are going on very early. Still, not a lot of people are up, but the people who hated Jesus were. And that's the reason why they're putting the pressure on Pilate. The people that were sympathetic to Jesus were not around. Now, Pilate knew that he had been forced to this by the Jews. And so notice the retaliation by making this stinging remark as he brings Jesus out on the pavement to pronounce judgment, behold, your king. Well, obviously, they did not consider Jesus to be their king, and Pilate knew that. This made them only angrier. And so they cried out in verse 15, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate stings them again. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, we've been noting the hypocrisy of the, of the Jews throughout this whole process. And again, note their hypocrisy here. They hated Caesar. They hated the Romans. They hated the Roman occupation of their land. But at this moment, they hated Jesus even more. Uh, Henry Alford points out, some of those who thus cried died miserably in rebellion against Caesar 40 years afterwards, but it suited their purpose. Knowing that nothing else would then satisfy them and that he was in danger of impeachment, Pilate finally handed Jesus over to be crucified. And again, all of this is just as God had planned it. This was His will. We've seen, again, the numerous quotations from the Old Testament to show that this is exactly what the Lord intended. Now, one thing I just want to mention, because from our meditation and what we're seeing taking place here as we think about God's sovereignty, as we think about uh, what man has done here in this case, I thought we would um, take a look at this as an example of how God operates, how God can be sovereign, and how man can be still responsible. Now, it's clear that all of this was God's plan. I mean, we've, we've noted, again, the, the predictions, the prophecies from the Old Testament. It was His plan that Jesus be betrayed and arrested. It was His plan that He be tried both by the Jews and by the Romans. It was God's plan that He be condemned by both and that he be treated in the way that we've seen, but also that he be executed by the Romans. Remember Jesus, uh, well, we, we saw this morning that um, Jesus had to be crucified. He had said earlier, if the Son of Man be lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. And the fact that he was being handed over to the Romans to be condemned and crucified by them was the fulfillment of what Jesus had said earlier. All of these things were taking place according to God's plan. But it's also clear that in His plan, God allowed for the free choices of those who were involved. Sometimes we think we can think of God's sovereignty as making pawns out of everybody that's involved. Judas, was he a pawn? Did he not have freedom either to confess Jesus or to deny Jesus, to betray Him or not betray Him? What about Annas, the, uh, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, whose house he went to first? Or Caiaphas, whom the Lord just said, because he handed me over to you, Pilate, he has the greater sin. And what about Pilate? Couldn't he have chosen to do the right thing in this case, but he chose against it because of the pressure the people were putting on him? And of course, Herod, as we saw, also grouped in um, what... The apostles were earlier praying in Acts chapter 4. God allowed for their free choices. They chose what they wanted freely in each of the decisions they were faced with so that they might be responsible for these choices. God holds them responsible. He calls them wicked men. They acted wickedly. It's the same thing as when Joseph's brothers handed Joseph over to be sold as a slave into Egypt and how the Lord brought about the salvation of his people through Joseph. Joseph's brothers were still accountable for what they did. Joseph said to them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good? What do you mean God meant it for good? What did God have to do with it? 
Well, God was the one who brought this about. He was the one that allowed you to sell me into slavery so that I might be brought into Egypt and become the redeemer of basically the Jews in Egypt. And Joseph was a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we see the same thing going on here, that God delivered Jesus over into the hands of wicked men who hated him. All of them hated him for one reason or another, and they handed him over to death. They did that freely. That is what God meant through this. And through this, he brought about good. Now, again, we see that in Acts chapter 4, verses 28, 24 through 28, that after Peter and John had been arrested and released, they returned and reported what had happened to their companions. And I want you to notice that as I read this, they quote the second psalm. I mentioned earlier in the service, the second psalm was exactly about what we're looking at here. And then they, they talk about its fulfillment in what we've just seen. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, and this is from the second psalm, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur." Now again, notice this is entirely God's plan. Everything that happened, happened according to His will, and yet God still holds them accountable. And I want you to notice too, the wonderful thing that God is able to do through the wicked actions of men. He is able to bring good out of evil. That's something that really only God can do. Now God in His plan arranged things in such a way that the greatest crime in history, which is crucifying, executing the Son of God, who was absolutely pure and perfect, would also be the Lord's greatest act of redemption. God brought about the greatest good from the greatest evil that could have been perpetrated by men. God uses evil for good purposes. And that reminds us that God can and will rule and overrule all things for the advancing of His kingdom and for your good and for my good, as He said He would, even all the evil that's going on in the world. Now, I thought this would be particularly good at this time because we see so much evil going on in the world. We need to understand that, the God, that God is in control of those things. They're not happening by accident, that we shouldn't be afraid of the wicked things that are happening because we know God has a plan to use those things for His glory. We shouldn't be afraid of the particular struggles and trials that we have to face in life because the Lord says if you love Him, He says if you're trusting Him, if you're turning from your sins, if you're following Jesus, that He will take those trials and He will work them all together for good. And how do we know that He will do that? Well, because He gave us His Son. And if He is willing to give us a Son to go through all that He has gone through in order to sanctify all the things that happen to us in life, if He's willing to give His Son, how much more is He going to make sure that He fulfills the second part of that promise, which is that He is going to work all these things together for good? God has a purpose. God has a plan. Jesus, through His life through His death, through His resurrection, but basically through His giving Himself up willingly for our salvation, has basically set His blood as a seal to the promise of God, that He will take all that happens to us in life, He will sanctify all of these things to our growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we have a clear example of how He is able to overrule evil for good. And He does it not just in this instance, but He allows all the evil that He allows in the world in order that He may overrule it for good, for our good. And that includes all the things that we have to face in that because of what He has done 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's remember that as we see our Lord submitting to all this mistreatment, all this injustice, all this suffering, all this torture, and as He will go to the cross, He did all of these things so that He might save us and so that He might give us this grand promise that regardless of what we have to face in life, He will work it together for our good, even as the Lord worked what He went through together for His good. Jesus had to go to the cross in order that He might be exalted over the world, over every name that is named, over every power and every authority, so that He might have the power to do what He has promised us that He will do for us. Now, next week, we'll look at the crucifixion. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of silent prayer and ask that the Lord might use what we've heard 